Where is that? In the evening, it's also. Uh, They'll do the same thing in the evening, but not in the evening. And you know what happened? Good morning, anybody there? I see Bradley, but do you hear me, Bradley? Does anybody hear me? Larry, it's Brian, I hear you. Oh, Brian, okay, thank you. You calling in, Brian, also? Yep, no, I I'm guess They're setting up the room. Where are you with a Long Island map behind you, even though it's fake, I'm sure? Home office today. Ah. Uh, you're going all out Long Island by with the map, huh? How you been? I haven't spoken to you in a while. There you go. Hi, can you guys hear us on, on the Zoom? Hello? I can hear everybody. It's Deborah Greig. I, I hear can the hear you. You know what I mean? Rich and, um, uh, thank you. Okay. That's fine. Thanks. All right, Mike, get back from uh, Jessica, how about your pen? My pen. Uh, Walter uh, emailed to someone else, but I was included. He has doctors, all kinds of um, therapy, so he's not going to be able to. Okay. Oh. Could it help, Jessica? That's okay. I was, I was trying to see how long my arms are. You know the view that you're offering? That's not great. Yes. 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 Or Downstairs. 
Yeah, we're good. We just have to unmute. Is it unmuted already? Okay. You guys can hear us okay still? Oh, give us a thumbs yes, up. Okay, we good. hear the group. Okay, great. Thank you. Meeting to order at 12.04 p.m. Uh, the first item on the agenda would be the approval of the June 2nd agenda. Uh, good motion. Second. Ready? Any, any opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Okay, the agenda is approved. Uh, the, need the approval of the March 3rd meeting minutes. Um, do we have a motion on that or do we have any? Move. Okay. Any opposed? Any? Corrections? Corrections? Okay, perfect. Over the meeting minutes, we'll go down to the TCAC LIRRCC combined chair report. <coughs> oh, yeah. No, this okay. All righty. All righty. Uh, press conference was held on Tuesday, uh, May 31st, regarding major service improvements on the well, IRR, about 40% in total with the opening of the east side access, which, by the way, will be known uh, as Grand Central Madison going forward. Yeah. Details on the service expansion will be made available shortly. Uh, in fact, uh, Kathy might touch on some of those later at this meeting. Uh, we are continuing our outreach with elected officials in an attempt to fill numerous vacancies on all three of our councils. Uh, the Nassau County and Suffolk County Executive's nominees for the MTA Board have made it through the Senate, and we expect to see them at the next board meeting, assuming the governor signs off on their appointments. Uh, Nassau County Exec Lakeman renominated David Mack, whose term expired. Uh, Suffolk County Executive Steve Malone has nominated Samuel Chu, Chief Executive and Chief Executive and Founder of Edgewise Energy, a clean energy startup. He formerly served as the Suffolk County Planning on the Suffolk County Planning Commission and has chaired the county's Workforce Development Board. Chu previously served as Malone's Chief of Staff and as a County Commissioner of Labor, Licensing, and Consumer Affairs. <clears throat> it will be good to have a full Long Island representation on the board again, especially with Grand Central Madison and third track coming online later this year. The MTA Intrusion Task Force released a report last week after the May MTA board meeting. If you have not seen a copy of this report and you would like one, please advise the PCAHC office and we'll get that over to you. Uh, we finally had some movement on wage works with Congresswoman Rice and Senator Gillibrand introducing legislation that would allow people with money trapped in pre-tax transit benefit programs to finally be able to get it out in a one-shot arrangement that would also <clears throat> require them to pay taxes. Uh, one of our community council has been working on this for two years. Uh, Larry Rubenstein has been key in uh, keep getting in touch with people who have trapped money to illustrate the problem. Uh, unfortunately, this won't help people who are laid off or otherwise lost their jobs and money, but that's something we're still working on. So it's still a work in progress. And again, this legislation has just been introduced, so it's got a ways to go yet. Uh, the MTA Working Group on Resilience held their fourth and final meeting on Thursday, May 25th, and it is hoped that their report will be issued sometime during the MTA's June board meeting. I had the pleasure of serving on that working group. Uh, Lisa has been asked to serve on the Blue Ribbon Fair Evasion Task Force, which had its first meeting yesterday. Stopping the financial bleed at the turnstile and those who come in to do others harm is key to the system's future. Uh, going down to the Long Island Railroad, uh, another fairly quiet month. <clears throat> uh, third track and east side access, or Grand Central Madison, continue to move ahead on the schedule. <laughs> as well as <clears throat> the Penn Station concourse expansion. Uh, some of our council members have expressed concerns regarding motorized bike scooters, which are becoming more and more common on the Long Island Railroad. 
We are reaching out to MTA senior management regarding this issue while simultaneously doing some research on the subject. Uh, we had a brief discussion on that at our last uh, Wild River Community Council meeting. Uh, okay, PCA has been tasked with making recommendations uh, regarding the bike pet. We'll go over that later. And also, uh, for those who haven't heard, uh, Bradley Bashiris has agreed to the salary offered by the MTA after a bit of negotiations, and we're formally accepting the position of the PCA the Executive Director, Associate Director. And we will now be. We will now be. Whoa! 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 So we will now begin the process of backfilling his his vacated. Does anybody? Effective date. March twenty first. Oh, back to So you are ready. Yeah, he is. All right. Yeah. As associate director, he's going to have to work a little yeah. bit longer. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's a quick upgrade. I'll give him at least three months. Yeah, at least. At least. All righty, so does anybody have any questions regarding my reports? With there being no questions, we'll be on the thing. All right. Right. Oh, wait a second, Ron. Troy. Yeah. Ron. All right. Yeah, Ron. Sorry, Ron, you're muted. Yeah, I, I had to turn it off. Just a quick question. Could the councils consider uh, offering a different name like Grand Central Dash Long Island Railroad? Because Madison Avenue is just one of many sets of ways to get in and out. It's got really nothing to do with east side access other than some of the entrances are there. So Grand Central Long Island Railroad or LIRR would make a lot more sense. Well, uh, yeah, um, lower level. Hi. <laughs> well, we have a lower level. Uh, can I still, can I comment on that? Sure, Trudy, you go ahead. I'll, I'll go it's after been you. Pointed, it's been pointed out to me, and it was in the media yesterday, but a number, a lot, especially Manhattan people, were calling to say, there's that mean that it goes all the way down to Madison, across the Madison Garden? And when I asked her, I heard three Madison, you know, they're thinking that Madison is Madison Square Garden. And then on um, New York One, and I don't remember if it was Channel 7 or Channel it's 2, they did this, whoever was reporting on it said there's a lot of confusion because it, people think it's Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. So can we maybe just make a comment or, I, I mean, this was the governor's choice, so I don't know if she's going to... But maybe we can go on the record as saying that we have, uh, you know, other ideas to lessen the confusion. Oh, I, I, if you want me to make a motion, I will. So can I, so I just want to, if, if you're, if you're finished. Yeah. So um, at the press conference, which um, I attended on Tuesday, because yeah. they had to have it on the hottest day when you had to wear work with, um, <laughs> the governor was asked, uh, and Jenna was asked about the, the choice of names. And, the response, the response was that there had been um, there had been focus groups that were held with riders, although nobody oh, in this room well. that I know was asked, uh, and that everybody knows Grand Central, uh, and that the exits are up and down Madison Avenue, and that that's the where that where you can where you can line up on your train to, to choose any any selection of exits. Um, and that it was it was done through the MTA communications office. Uh, and there's t-shirts made up, so I don't know if that means. We have an interesting to find out what the other options were. Yeah. Can I? I'm going to well. offer yes, this. I'm going to offer this as a motion then, okay? Because I was at, I was virtually at the press conference also, and I let my opinions be known. Some people, the governor's office, said that, but I would like if. Uh, well, I'll make a motion. We can vote if we want to or not. That we that we we think that it is not a suitable name because. And uh, by the way, the number seven has an exit on Madison Avenue. Also, you know, if you go all the way through, uh, so that we we don't think this name this that or we think that this name will cause a lot of confusion based on what we've heard already, and we would like to know if there is any possibility of reconsidering the name before 
I think side connection opens in December. This gives us six months <coughs> and plenty of time to redo maps, T-shirts, or anything else. So anyway, that's my motion. All right. Uh, Trudy has a motion on the back one. All right. Andrew seconds it. I want to just speak to the, to the issue. Sure. Um, everybody knows where Grand Central is. Grand Central has lots of available exits. It never was called Grand Central Lexington or Grand Central Park <laughs> for, those, for those exits. Um, the fact that Long Island Railroad riders will have a choice of terminal, everybody knows Grand Central. So it's Penn Station or Grand Central. Terminal. Yeah. And I think that's what we want to see on the timetable. And I, I, you know, maybe this was an attempt to make a statement that there are now going to be lots of exits on Madison Avenue. Um, you know, want to call it Grand Central oh, or for Long Island Railroad East Side Terminal or something. But I think Grand Central Madison is just not the right name. I'm done. Yeah, well, that, that's yeah. that's awesome. What well, you guys have better memory than me? What was the name of the new agency we created here? So I did a, I did a quick Google search on Grand Central Madison, and the uh, and Vinny's on the call. Maybe he has a, um, some other uh, recollection as well. But the Grand Central Madison Operating Authority came up. So I don't know if it's changed or if there's if somebody just took that that name. I didn't go anything deeper into it. My thought, as I was also thinking that this was an interesting choice of name, was that Grand Central Terminal doesn't say Grand Central Terminal Metro North. So to say Grand Central Terminal Long Island Railroad then sort of heightens the split between the railroads. Um, and that, that, but that, to, that, you know, at some point there's it really needs to differentiate, but Madison does cause, I think, but in regard is as I said, that what came up over and over and over again from the people who contacted me, and then I'm watching the news reports on this, and I can't remember. Um, it was somebody on New York one, not you, not what's his name, uh, Dan, but somebody else, and then they they all started talking about it and saying this is ridiculous. One of the reports. Anyway, that was my reason for uh, putting in the. Okay. Well, they, they won't. They won't just make it generally Grand Central because it is two two separate and distinct. For legal purposes, it's two separate and distinct. No, my motion is not to yeah. give it another name. It's just to consider. It oh yeah, no, no, that, that's I'm fine. Not saying, We're just I'm not saying state, giving it a, a name, another name. We're just stating our objection to that this the, name confusion. is no good. Motion is to consider a different name. Right. Yeah. That, we, that we feel. Grand Central Madison would create some a, a different name to be determined. And they've got, like you said, six months to come up with it. Gary? Yeah. yeah. And I agree with everyone because when I heard this name, and you know, you think about it, yes, I can understand it's Grand Central Madison over there, but the one thing is, is it doesn't have a purpose there. It's supposed to be just make it simple for a person to say Grand Central. It's a terminal. Everybody knows it's a terminal, but Leave, don't have to add additional names. Grand Central is there for a reason. It's been there for history, for hundreds of years. No. Why do they want to change a name? It's a hundred. And, and a pronouncement. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If you think about it, it's funny, but it's also... It's, it's, no, Chris, it just goes back to my point. It, they want to keep it as two separate and distinct stations for whatever reason. It's not. So that's why. Well. It's linked. It's it, it just like no, they're, they're, isn't Penn Station Penn Station regardless of who's going in there? I mean, Amtrak goes in there, a railroad goes in there. Isn't it just to Penn ahead. Station? Well, I think that I think the I think the point right now is we just think the name is confusing, and we think that you should reconsider, and that's what we're going to vote on. Exactly. Oh, we can we can stand here and, and have this we, discussion we for an hour. Name. And Jerry, can we just call ask, the question before we do, I just want to add for the record that if they were setting up this group. They did, I feel very disgusted that they didn't invite any of, of us or the disability community or this, anyone. So I'd like to be clear for the record, I'm very disappointed. No, it's not. I thought very disgusted. I could say that, but I'll take your word. point, it sounds. Okay. It's more yeah, we, business like. More business Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion on the floor that's been seconded. All in favor? Aye. Do we have any opposed? Motion carries. Unanimously. 
understand. Like, so okay, so there are some votes from our non-voting from people who don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you for bringing it up. Alrighty, so that will take us down to Andrew's uh, chair's report. The uh, transit riders. Well, ridership. Um, we had a, a record uh, about a week and a half ago of 3.6 million on a on a given day, which was great. Um, ridership sort of has plateaued. Uh, we would like to hear some new records uh, in the coming weeks. Um, I think people want to get out. Uh, people, a lot of people have cabin fever, and um, the fact that weekend ridership is so high shows that people are willing to use the system. They're using it on a discretionary basis to get out, to go to shows, games, whatever, restaurants. Um, they, have not, they have not yet, in large numbers, returned to work, which is why the rush hour numbers are not. Yeah, something like that. Um, five days a week. Um, commuter rails are likewise high on weekends. Uh, I have seen some records recently on both railroads, which is another great sign that people are willing to use the system. They're not necessarily right, obviously some folks are, but um, speaking of which, um, the po there are additional police throughout the system. I, ha I have recently seen statistics that say uh, 1,379 homeless have accepted services, which is a great sign. What we don't know is how long they remain in, in the services, if they come back in a day or two days. Uh, but that's a great sign. Uh, teams continue to round, I say round up, remove uh, <laughs> passengers at the ends of lines and, and offer them the services. Um, that there are uh, groups of teams that are doing this, and we hope everybody gets the service they need. On my trip down here today, I saw a mentally unhinged person, and there were some tourists on the train, and they said, what the hell is going on? So it is unsettling uh, to see some people ranting uh, occasionally, and we've got to get a hold of this. The system is the key to our economic recovery, and we simply must get everybody feeling safe. Um, fare evasion, uh, you're going to hear more, I'm sure, from, from Lisa, who is a member of the Fare Evasion Task Force, but it continues to be rampant. Um, I was at a station yesterday. I reported it to Chief Wilcox. There were two, 14th Street, Union Square, there were two officers there standing inches from the slam gate. People were pouring into the slam gate. I went over to the officers and I said, look, aren't you going to do anything? We can't stop everybody, was the response. I reported this to Chief Wilcox and I did uh, record one of the officers' um, badge numbers. And Andrew, did you report about my experience 20 minutes after that? When uh, I did not. Oh, uh, but I, I told you I was going to do that. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, it, it was a recurring of uh, Trudy, I think was at the location like 20 minutes after what I reported, and bingo, the same thing. People just flowing in. Uh, some of them were school children, and they said to me, the police officers, but these are, I said, they have school cars. They can, they can swipe them. That's what they're for. Uh, I actually pushed the door shut on someone and said, pay your fare. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, the, the police I, officer, I won't make a habit. We were after the first incident, and then I came back. It was at 14th Street. It was at Union Square, just yeah. in case you want to. I said that. Oh, and the whole thing is, I waved. When I came back, I waved to the officers like, hi, remember me? And all of a sudden, the slam gate gets pushed open. And I went over, I said, it's still happening. And he said, and it's going to keep on happening. We are not here to watch, you know, who goes through there. We're here for safety, I said. Mm -hmm. I think that you know that safety. And then he said, well, thank you very much for your concern. And I said, thank you for doing a job. Mm -hmm. And I walked away. But that's the attitude. They so if, really if, if this is repeated, in 472 stations, well, because you don't have police in 472 of them, but um, if you have them in hundreds of places, there is a massive flaw. And I said to one person who I saw doing a very athletic leap over the turnstile, I said, you want service cuts? Keep doing that. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to let it, I'm not going to, it's just horrific. It's horrifying, really. The point is that that's happening at stations with police officers Can standing right there. Not what's going on at stations that are not the, the whole point is, is that the police officers see it, and they don't want to get involved with something like that. That's, I mean, when a police officer says, we're here to protect the safety, 
of the passengers. And I say, that's one of the ways you protect the safety. And so there's no point getting into a discussion. Yeah, no, we, we could be here for a I know uh, uh, we, we have a yeah, Andrew finish issue, up. Let me move on with yeah, that. Yeah, let Andrew finish up. Um, Queen Bus's redesign is ramping up uh, for its ultimate conclusion, uh, which will happen shortly. We had a presentation at Transit Riders Council. Many members asked questions. Uh, there are um, Karen, uh, have you attended some of these? You have. I have too, Andrew. There was okay. one Tuesday night. Yeah. Everybody has. When is the last one? Tonight. 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 Wow. You know, so, Rockaway. Yeah. You know, yeah, and you live there. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully um, <laughs> good. some good will have come out of these. <laughs> it's a good sign with the Bronx bus redesign that they redrew the whole thing because people protested, which would have had some people walking up huge sea hills to get routes that they didn't used to have to do. So they redid that one. I hope they redid this. They redid this one a lot. Um, I, I haven't looked at every aspect of it, but I am sure we will hear more about this. Um, um, and uh, that's a good sign. Just saying if they redid it based on the, the Times article. Um, there is a brand new uh, exit from the Times Square station mm -hmm. in the heart of Times Square now. Yes. You don't need a detective to find that tiny little entrance <laughs> that used to be next to that building. Yes, I took it's a picture very of obvious. It. It's yeah. easily uh, observed from lots of places, and it gives you great connections. So that is wonderful. And there's some beautiful Nick Cave, some more, I should say, beautiful Nick Cave artwork in that uh, entranceway. And of course, the, sh the new shuttle passageway to the Avenue. That's magnificent. And the last thing I will just say is um, the, one, the escalators at 181st Street are out. Uh, this is causing a lot of hardship for folks who need, uh, who are not ADA. Were these uh, recently done? Like, how no, they've been done? no. They're, they're re now they're being done. There is still oh, an elevator at the 184th Street end of 181st Street on Fort Washington Avenue. Um, it is hilly there, so that's helpful to some, but not to all. <coughs> uh, they are rushing to get this done. Hopefully by January. Uh, that's a long time away, though. I cannot imagine why it takes so damn long. But January is what I'm hearing. So that's a long one. Um, they may, if they may be in worse shape than we than we thought. It is a very deep station. Stations in Washington Heights are very deep, obviously. Um, so we will be following this and pushing for them to get it done. I also heard something which is very encouraging. Um, hopefully, it will come to pass. Uh, there is talk with Columbia University, who will have a new campus on 125th Street, of partially paying for making the 125th Street number one station elevator wow. uh, equipped, that's which great. that's a high station. That's that great. will be wonderful. MTA would pay for part. Columbia University would pay for part. We need, we're we're sure. holding out hope that this deal yeah, does happen. Sure that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I believe we have a question on yeah. the screen. Say that. Oh, great. All right. Yeah. Um, Chris, two things. As Andrew mentioned, 125th, Edith mentioned that two years ago, two or three years ago. Um, this is before um, Lisa, you actually worked. This is where Bill Henderson was here. So wow. that's, that's more than what yeah, I was just saying, okay. but she did bring it up from there to there. She said the college was working on a deal to get an el uh, add an elevator at 125 on the one. So that is still in the plan. So Andrew adding that in, that's something Edith was trying to do too. Wow. And the other question I'd like to bang up also quickly, an expressway, um, if we're going to talk about uh, fare, fare invasion, we need to also remind the buses also that are doing that too. That's, as well. part, that's part of the concern. Yes. Yeah. And just to let everyone know, the concern is, is, is Union Square at 125th Street on the Lex is very dangerous. That is a bad one. Those two are like, forget it. Every you time have, I you go have to, that you thing. have to, you have to like, if I'm with someone, I have to go in first just to watch them saying, don't even try it. Yeah. So let's I've reported that, Chris. Uh, yeah. That station is, has some rampant issues, selling of swipes and other types of things. And other stuff, too. And, and of course, Sutphin Archer, where a lot of first-time visitors or tourists come to New York and switch to the subway, they're offered things at Sutphin yeah. Archer that should not be happening. And, speaking, and don't forget, we'll phone you and elevate this over now. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I heard about that. Our, our, our 1230 guest is here. Right. For the record, can we just note that the Manhattan Borough President's Office has been working on this for mm -hmm. even before he was officially Borough President and has been working very closely with Columbia, with okay. individuals mm -hmm. at Columbia University. So just, we have that for the record. All right, we'll record that. Then we'll just, we've got the one on the screen. Uh, 
Ms. Cry, if you want to ask your question or make comments. Yes, thank you very, very much. Uh, first question is reference with the fair evasion. And yes, I was at Livonia yesterday with Q. We were checking the elevators and accessibility. I saw so much fair evasion, but this is a bigger problem for people with disabilities like myself. And it happened with Edith. We would put our cards in because we have auto gate cards. And next thing you know, people have actually shoved me through and physically, and I'm looking like, oh great, the cops are gonna think that I let them in. And they just wait for someone with a disability who has to use the gates to come in. And at one of the meetings when you had the new uh, head of the MTA police, I said, please make sure your officers realize what they're doing to people with disabilities. It even happened yesterday when I was trying to go in or out, they tried to knock me down to get in. And I don't want to be blamed because I need to use the gate because I'm using a walker now. And it was scary when I was in the wheelchair. So what can be done? And is there a person with disabilities on the task force discussing this? We, we, just, had our, we just had our first meeting yesterday. I, 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 um, I'm in a fortunate position to hear uh, your, the issues that you raise, and I will, um, and you know, yesterday was an introductory meeting, but those are absolutely issues that I hear and will take and, and plan to take as specific concerns, and also some in Archer are, um, and those, and those, some of those touch points, and, and slam the gates, but Deborah, I've written in my notes that I brought to the meeting with me the slam gate and um, access and disabled access. Um, and the the harm that could happen to somebody who goes through this. So absolutely, you say at numerous meetings, yeah. there are people that will wait at slam gates mm -hmm. in unattended entrances yes. for two or three trains until someone exits through there yes. and then rush in. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, just Very one thing I want to add. I if okay. you need a volunteer for that committee, I will volunteer. It's not my committee. Yeah, I know. I, I, Volunteer either. I would ask this, Eric, and I appreciate the. I greatly appreciate the honor to be on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank our, you. Okay. Our, since our 12:30 guest is here, Randy, would you mind just uh, yeah. if we go with it together sure, and then sure, we'll sure, go sure, back sure. in? No problem. And then, I'll, and then, because we had a question about um, new fair um, design, so I'll, I'll, after you go uh, after this right. conversation, I'll give a little additional update on the on the um, derivation. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jessica Matthews and Will Schwartz are on the phone, um, are on our Zoom, and um, we very much appreciate your coming. Uh, this is the first of a two-part um, of a of a, the first of a two-part of the two presenter. Two, two, two oh, presenter, oh yeah. <laughs> um, so as you as you know, uh, PCAC has been legislatively um, mandated, required to uh, contribute. Uh, as part of the MTA's uh, bike pet, uh, bicycle pedestrian micro, micro mobility access plan, um, which the MTA has due by the end of the year. I'm not going to give you a presentation for you guys. Uh, don't worry. But um, and and our uh, contribution to that plan, which we'll discuss after your presentation, is due uh, yesterday. But we are going to discuss it today, as I've uh, as I've spoken about it with Jessica. Um, and so, without further ado, without further ado, I'm going to allow Jessica Matthew and Will Schwartz, our guests, to um, share the screen and give us an overview of what they're doing, um, and uh, provide an overview of what the MTA is doing. And then we will go. We, Kara will, is going to give um, an overview of uh, the. the what, what PCAC's recommendations will be um, for discussions um, that we will submit to you guys um, actually tomorrow after we've had, after everyone's had an opportunity to review my end. So, with that, I yield to the floor. Great, thanks, Lisa, and hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, my name is Jessica Matthew. I'm a senior advisor for special projects in the chair's office at the MTA. Um, 
we are very excited both to present um, you know, where we are to date with our planning process, but also to hear more about the recommendations you all will be um, submitting this week. We, again, also just look forward to working with you closely as we develop this plan further through the rest of this calendar year as well. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, um, this plan is required by state legislation that was passed in 2021, um, specifically looking at bicycle and pedestrian access to our bridge facilities, um, to our services and um, on board our trains and buses where it makes sense. Um, we are going a step further and are going to be including micro mobility as well in this planning process um, because we are seeing um, you know every day a new device that people are using for micro mobility and want to make sure that um, we are we have that foresight in our planning process um, so uh, as lisa mentioned we're expecting your recommendations today and then we'll continue on with our planning process through the end of this calendar year um, leading up to publication of our strategic action plan in December. Um, but we expect that implementation and continuous sort of improvement will go on into the next calendar year as well. Um, so aside from the legislative mandate, you know, we really want to be responsive to the trends that we're seeing and really see um, bicycle, pedestrian, and micromobility modes as an extension of our system in many ways and an attractive option um, that provides flexibility for people to get to our services. Um, specifically in New York City, year over year from 2014 to 2019, um, the city saw a nearly 5% uh, year over year annual growth, uh, leading up to 194 million um, total bicycle trips in 2019. And then we saw that trend um, further within the pandemic, where when we look from 2019 to 2020, there was a 33% growth in a single year um, in that first year of the pandemic. Um, as we're going through this planning process, we're also keeping a few different planning principles front and center. Um, first, focusing on transportation equity, especially, um, you know, considering those that have outsized commute times um, and also neighborhoods that have had outsized environmental justice impacts historically. Um, we are proactively um, engaging with various stakeholders, um, you all, of course, but different advocacy groups, um, different municipalities, um, as well as uh, various planning organizations and bicycle planning experts. And then um, integrated planning, aside from you know, publishing the plan that we're required to do, we wanna make sure that as we're going through this process, we're thinking through ways that um, we can embed consideration of um, bicycle, pedestrian and micromobility access measures in our operational and capital planning processes on an ongoing basis. There are a couple of high level areas that we're looking at as we develop this plan, um, bike and scooter access to our subway stations and bus stops. Um, here we've been working really closely with New York City DOT um, to look at ways that we can partner to expand um, a lot of the work that they've really started off with, um, especially around uh, public bike parking, uh, citing bike racks around the city, um, as well as the uh, bike network as well. Um, bike and scooter access to the Long Island Railroad and Metro North stations. Here, um, uh, there's an ongoing first mile, last mile study that um, MTA's transit oriented development team is undertaking. And uh, they've uh, engaged extensively in the commuter rail territories to shift the mode away from driving and um, toward things like um, bike and ped access. Uh, so here, uh, there will be uh, some specific partnerships with um, municipalities that will culminate in a few different pilot projects that will uh, come out of that study later on. 
Um, integration with bike sharing services, we want to make um, trip planning and payments as seamless as possible down the line when we're further along into um, the implementation, um, looking ahead into, you know, the very end of 2023 and beginning of 2024. Um, and then also looking at pedestrian and bike and scooter access to our bridges. Um, we have uh, quite a few large projects planned in the 2020 to 2024 capital program and uh, continuous assessment on this front will continue with the current 20 year needs assessment that we're undertaking um, and you know, on an ongoing basis in the next capital planning cycle. Uh, just to give you a sense of where we are in the process, um, to date this year, we've had a series of different kickoff meetings and stakeholder engagement um, and compiling feedback on some of these initial areas for exploration. Um, you all uh, may have seen on Friday, we put out a press release um, publishing a, a public facing project website for this effort that includes um, a a place for folks to submit public comments on the plan. Um, actually, to date, we've already received 78 comments and um, are going through a process of sort of categorizing those and making sure that um, we're comprehensively considering that as a part of our planning process. Um, and we've onboarded a consultant team led by Sam Schwartz Engineering to help us with the next phase of work, which is really going to get into um, an analysis, in-depth analysis of our gaps and opportunities, and then also um, a survey of best practices and figuring out, you know, which of those can apply to the MTA um, and work with our system. And all of that, of course, will uh, culminate in publication in December. Um, we're anticipating a few more rounds of outreach coming up in um, the later summer and fall as well. Um, so that is all I have. Um, I can take any questions or Lisa, I don't know if you wanted to go on to the next presentation first. Uh, let's see if there are any questions in the room first. Yeah, I have one. Yeah. Thanks, Jessica. Um, let's do this. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, so uh, my question is, while I think this is all great, um, I also have witnessed, as I'm sure many of our fellow riders have, people with bicycles on board subway trains um, not being considerate, um, scooters zooming down subway platforms, sometimes, of course, with explosive batteries on board. We've seen the results of some of those with house fires and other things. What are we doing? I, I think it's great that bikes have access to subway stations and parking thereby, but bringing them on board, I think, could be problematic. So what are we yeah. doing to distinguish access to the, to, the, to the transit system from actually bringing it on the transit system? Yeah, I totally hear those concerns. And we, um, I think a, a couple of different aspects of addressing that issue. I do think one of the reasons people are um, inclined to bring their uh, bike or scooter on board is that there isn't currently a secure bike parking option for them at either end of their trip. Um, and so I think that um, making that a really uh, concentrated effort as part of this planning process will help alleviate the issue. Um, and then our uh, uh, security office team is um, doing an MTA wide hazard assessment on um, e scooters and e bikes in particular. And uh, we're hoping to be able to report out on the results of that study um, later on this year as well. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to just add to that that each of our councils has expressed concern about that. So we welcome the opportunity to speak to the um, team. That's um, that's reviewing that um, and to and to weigh in on the issues and concerns that uh, we have that that our members have heard, had and that we've heard too, so that it's a full um, full input. Um, in the room, we have two more questions for you. Uh, yes, in our recommendation, we haven't gotten to our recommendation. No, no, but I just want to 
make a point that when we say doing things in consulting with the community. We haven't gotten there yet. We'd like to do a whole presentation on our recommendations first, please. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we're going to do their, their, um, theirs first, and then we're going to, and then Kara is going to give a presentation on, on, on what we have. Um, we have to give. And then we them. have to give, and then we're going to discuss that. Oh, so what, what we have here we, is not final. Correct. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, um, I heard what she was saying, and I actually have to agree with Andrew, but the adding the one piece of the puzzle, uh, accessibility is one thing I want to make sure I add this clearly, because wheelchairs, walkers, and any devices, they need, we need to make it very clear on any railroad and subway trains that accessibility, they need the access to get on the train, too. Yeah because people are not bicycles, they're human beings, and bicycles can actually go other parts of the train, because I've seen this on the rail Long Island Railroad and using a great example, because yes, wheel wheelchairs, walkers, baby strollers, the three priorities, and I did them in order. So we need to make it very clear for all accessibility, from A to Z. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart? Thanks, Lisa. So, Jessica, quick question, two, two part. In the slides, you talked about the number of rides. Do we know what that translates into in terms of individual users? Uh, you know, how, how large this community is? So, um, part of the uh, limitation on uh, the way that this type of data is collected is um, even within New York City, we're using um, bike counters in specific locations and then inferring from that, you know, what is the total number of rides uh, to date. Um, I do want to note uh, one of our subconsultants that's part of this Sam Schwartz team, a, a firm called Urban Cycling Solutions, just actually finished the um, largest uh, cycling census that's ever been completed for New York State. So the results of that census are going to be published very soon. Soon and we'll be able to answer questions just like that in the near term. Okay, and the other little part of my question, you know, when Andrew was asking his question, um, there are people who use rail and the subway to take their bikes to then get to a trail or some other venue to ride and use their, 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 their cycle, or they may use it as part of work. Um, is a time restriction on rail or on um, the subway, still something that's under consideration. I know for Long Island Railroad, thousands of years ago when I had a bike permit, there were time restrictions, um, but is that something that's come up in the conversation because people are using these implements for recreation and uh, we're touting all our systems. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely on the table. And I do believe for the railroads that um, people are, the permit requirement has been waived, but um, it's still discouraged to bring bikes on board during peak hours. Um, I also think, you know, in the next um, uh, procurement of rolling stock for oh. Metro North, for example, there will be more bike racks available on board so that you know, these things can be safely stored and accommodated without having conflicts with passengers. Thank you. Yep, and then we're going to go to, uh, yeah, Jessica, uh, yep. just a little concern, use the term discouraged mm -hmm. during rush hour. It's prohibited during rush hour. Uh, and I, I think you want to keep that in mind, especially as ridership starts to come back. I mean, they've been getting away with it now because we're at 60% of our pre-pandemic ridership, but when we get back up to 75, 80%, uh, not, there's not going to be room for those bikes. Agree with Jerry. Right. There, there's no, the, on the Long Island Railroad, it's like pre-pandemic ridership. You can barely get a seat. It's standing room only most of the time. And every so often, there's someone with a bike or a scooter, much less on the subway, when, as I said, it's like everyone's competing for space. Okay, it's allowed. Or racing. How are people supposed to store it, hold it, and make sure that it doesn't impact, especially when we're, you know, so those are things that really have to be and it goes right back taken into consideration yeah. and they have to be administered. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so, um, so I just backed up. 
Tara is going to um, offer our presentation that includes our recommendations. We've shared our um, slate of recommendations with our members that we're asking that uh, they everybody review um, provide input on, and then um, we'll submit to uh, the we'll submit to the MTA as our as our legislative mandate. But these requires. are able to be changed or modified or anything before we submit them. Right? Yeah, we haven't had our discussion. We haven't even done a presentation yet. Just put out today. This is so, the first time. Um, however, I also want to point out that on the um, as as um, Jessica and well noted that the website that went live on Friday includes a link for comments. So Karen um, and us and Jerry and everybody else and, and Chris uh, should definitely include your comments about fighting and Brian you certainly have had um, thoughts about it as well about including your comments on the website about um, space issues and time and those constraints. Um, okay, I'm going to now have to let me call the right screen. <clears throat> Tara is going to provide an overview of our recommendations. Charles, can I just show your hand? I'm sorry, and then we're going to um, get back to other questions. Okay. 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 Thank you. So thank you, Jessica, for going over the um, the legislation and your overview and your strategy for approaching a strategic plan. Sorry, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump right into our PCAC's draft recommendations for bike and pedestrian access. Uh, next slide, please. So we broke down our recommendations into New York City Transit and then the commuter rails, Metro North and Long Island Railroad, um, because we found that the, um, they have slightly different um, approaches to um, increasing bike and pedestrian access. So we, our first few recommendations for transit, um, first of all, is exploring ways to improve secure bicycle storage at, near, and around transit stations. Um, so this means expanding options like the Unipod Grand Central pilot program. We currently have it at a few stations. Um, other kinds of secure bike lockers, like the University of Toronto, to make sure that bikes are protected from both theft and also weather conditions. Um, this will help increase the likelihood that people will not bring their bikes on trains. Um, second, integrating Omni with City Bike and other bike share options. This means making it a lot more seamless for riders, um, both bicycle riders and transit riders, to more seamlessly um, integrate between the two and transfer between the two. And this will also open up the possibility of creative fare options, including things like um, fare capping and um, monthly memberships with city bike and transit as well. Um, third is improving coordination with New York City Department of Transportation so that bikes and buses do not conflict with each other on the street, including by separating bus lanes from bike lanes and making sure that each mode has its own dedicated space, similar to on 14th Street where there is a dedicated busway and then the nearby 12th and 13th Street bike lanes that are protected. Fourth, um, we encourage the MTA to study bus routes that might benefit from having bike racks on the front of buses, um, including buses that go over bridges that currently do not have bicycle access. This is similar to the buses that go over the Verrazano Bridge currently that do have bike racks and they have not found a significant um, time constraint um, when loading bikes onto those buses. So we, we'd like the MTA to continue studying other potential routes that that might work on. Um, fifth is to improve and clarify the current rules regarding bicycle storage on trains. Um, so we have an example all the way to the right of, um, depending on the kinds of vehicles that the MTA decides are restricted and allowed, making it very clear, printing out posters both in stations and on trains to make sure that everybody knows um, the restrictions and guidelines for what is and is not allowed on board. Um, currently, based on safety hazards and um, concerns from riders, we've, um, we've noted that electric and motorized um, vehicles are not um, currently permitted on trains. So making that clear is important. And also so that we're communicating through pamphlets similar to the one on the bottom here from Madrid, um, encouraging people to come 
and by stations, but also um, knowing the rules. Next slide, please. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty amazing. Definitely. Um, number six for New York City Transit is to use decals and stickers both on subway doors and on platform floors to show people with bicycles and scooters when they do bring them where the best places to stand and the best cars on the train to use would be. Um, so that includes in the picture to the right, um, potentially having a sticker on the actual car door or on the floor of the platform, um, similar to accessibility markers showing where the best place for a cyclist to stand is to bring a bicycle on an area of the train that may have more available space. Um, seventh is to work with City Bike, New York City Department of Transportation, and communities to recommend improvements that will increase access to transit, um, including wayfinding bike lanes in city bike locations. So this means making sure that bike lanes lead up to train stations and that the, the bike network is both expanded to um, farther into the city where there is not a, currently a complete bike network and also expanding city bikes out to the same areas of the city that do not currently have access. Next slide, A recommendation is that as the MTA rolls out its new neighborhood level detailed maps at each station, um, adding more nearby bike infrastructure to those detailed maps. They currently do have um, logos for nearby city bike racks um, on their neighborhood level maps, but adding more kinds of bike lanes. Um, they currently have bigger bike lanes like the Brooklyn Bridge and other um, major bike routes, but just indicating that people can bike to and from the station on these maps would be helpful. Ninth is to include bike navigation options on the MyMTA app and Trip Planner website and work with other app designers to incorporate this information. So on the bottom here, you can see that um, we did a suggested route from to Broadway right here to Penn Station a route that the fastest route shown on City Mapper would be to bike to the Wall Street 2 3 station to get to Penn Station. Um, but the MyMTA app nor the City Bike app offer both biking and transit as an option. So making sure that um, people who may consider using a City Bike or a bike to get to their um, destination transit are able to see that as the fastest route. And lastly, um, as Jessica mentioned, there is an ongoing New York, City, New York State bike census that's being completed currently. Um, and making sure that the MTA is using data from this bike census to continuously update their guidelines and um, their strategy for increasing bike access will be very helpful in the future. Next slide, please. And for our Metro North and Long Island Railroad recommendations, um, we have some similar recommendations. The first is taking advantage of underutilized MTA-owned parking lot space at commuter rail stations to increase secure bike storage especially with decreased ridership at a lot of stations, um, there is some unused parking lot space that um, is a great option for in increasing things like the Unipod Pilot and other options for secure parking, including working with nearby um, buildings and facilities to make sure that people have a secure place to park their bicycles. Um, second is improving and clarifying the rules regarding bicycle storage on trains. Um, similar to our recommendation for New York City Transit, making sure that everybody knows which kinds of vehicles are allowed on trains and stations, and um, indicating how people are able to um, lock up their bikes if that is the option on a certain train. Third is similarly using decals and stickers on train doors and platform floors to show which cars are the best for using a bicycle. Um, if there are bicycle racks on certain cars, indicating that on, the, um, on these decals would be extremely helpful as well. Um, and there's an image here of bicycle storage rack on Amtrak currently where cyclists are able to um, take off the front wheel and put their bike vertical so that it takes up as little space as possible. Next slide, please. And the last two recommendations are um, working with municipalities and local towns to develop first and last mile micro mobility pilot programs, um, similar to those that have been outlined by the MCA in the past, working with um, private companies such as Lime, Bird, other scooter and bike share companies, um, similar to what's already going on in Suffolk County in some places, to make sure that people have options if they don't own their own bicycles or scooters. And finally, working with municipalities to increase protected bike lanes, sidewalks, and wayfinding signs on roads that lead to stations, to make sure that people who are choosing to bike have a safe way to get there and maybe more likely to choose that option. Um, those are our recommendations that we have drafted so far, and we welcome any and all feedback on developing them. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Um, I, we discussed this at the TRC meeting. Wherever it says local communities, or uh, I know that in number one, and especially in number seven, it should not say in discussion with the local communities, but either with the local community board and or the local communities through members of the local community through their community boards. But it's got to go through the community boards because that's where all the discussion and has been going on, especially uh, where there are city bike now docking stations and there have been a lot of conflict, a lot of discussion, a lot of negative feeling about having them on, especially on certain streets. That's number one. And the other thing is in number one where it says uh, should work with office building management, it should be with local businesses because you don't want, you know, if you, if there are in especially now that like thing there, local businesses, stores, restaurants, whatever, that uh, are, however you want to word it, but it should be in discussion, should work with office building management and local um, stores, restaurants, you know, or local businesses, small businesses, whatever wording you want to use. But that should be, it shouldn't just be for the big major corporations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So noted. Gentlemen, uh, I have Mike Stanton uh, from the Metro North Commission. Um, first, PCAC. First, <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, this is a, a great piece of work. The one thing that, that stands out to me is that I don't see the word equity appearing in here. Um, and I was, I was hard to hear Jessica Matthews' presentation, the transportation equity is the first thing they're looking at. Um, we could either just endorse their continued focus on that or make our own recommendation, but I think it should be part of it. Um, if we do go ahead and, and go beyond what they said, she highlighted um, outside commute times and environmental in, in communities with histories of environmental justice issues. I'd recommend they also take a look at uh, economic disparities and, and uh, targeting uh, and try to make things. Thank you. We, 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 I think in the, in the more full document, yeah. we do talk about expanding um, to uh, expanding shares, shared bikes and uh, micro mobility. System to uh, communities that currently do not have them in consultation. With I heard that. Yeah, but, but yeah, I think it would be. I think it would go to the whole portfolio. I think it's a good point. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> and yeah, I do appreciate seeing that in there. Uh, and thank you for the presentation, Kara. Yeah. I was going to say a few things. Like, and I noticed that we had um, Toronto and. Tri-Rail, which I know very well from my time living in Florida, and I was one of the crazy people who actually commuted from Miami to Hollywood using Tri-Rail for a year, um, that, you know, we have to think about our, our landscape and what that means. So having bike lockers, would they be indoors? If it's in the railroad, would it be outdoors? Because outdoors, then you have to think about accessibility. We have sidewalks that are crowded, and you have people walking, you have... Um, people on wheelchairs and wheelchairs, and guess what? You have people who think that they can bike on the side. So I just want to make sure that we are really thinking about that. And I really do like the idea of lockers because if everybody here decided they wanted to bring their bicycles on the subway, the buses, we <laughs> know to go. You know, Toronto is just different because the biking is just in their infrastructure, right? Miami, you know, South Florida is very different because they have transit, but it's nothing like New York City. Tri-Rail doesn't ride, it's a bike on not with the same frequency. And when you get off, you're on your own. If you don't have a car, you don't know. So people really need their bikes and their scooters to move forward. Here we have a lot of choices. Don't forget Miami Metro Rail, too. Well, then, yeah, you have the, and then the people move when you're downtown Miami, yeah. and now yeah. you have the bike, yeah. don't make me show off now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah. You have the right line where they have it down as um, luggage. So, you know, I think that we need to be very thoughtful. I really appreciate the expansion into areas that don't have, because I think about it, you know, I drive to the railroad, but, you know, on a nice day, I could bike, and, and, and you know, if I could rent a car on America, maybe I'd bike to the leave it. And I think other people could use those choices where you pick up a scooter somewhere, you know, whatever, and drop it off. So okay. I just want us to be thoughtful. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, we're just going to take a question or a comment from Chris, and then we're going to move on because our and then, and then we can come back to this after after our after our presentation from Kathy. Well, we still got to we got we have to do some sort of get to Kathy. All right, so let, let, let me just get to my question very quickly and quickly. Accessibility needs to be in that category as well because where these bikes are parked, and Sharon is correct. When they ride their bike, they Karen. don't have respect. So we do Karen. need Karen. 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 Right now, I'm trying to go fast, so I'm trying to speed up. Sorry. <laughs> the main thing is, is this issue on the trains, and doesn't matter where they are. And regarding Staten Island, only the S53, if one of those buses do have it, has that hook. Mm -hmm. If we got to focus on it, we need to focus on the S93 and the S79 SBS. Those bike racks need to be on. Period. Okay. Thank All right. you. All right, so well, like I said, we'll circle back to this. Uh, right now, uh, we have Kathy Rinaldi on, who's going to give us a uh, brief presentation on the Eastside Access Service or whatever. Whatever uh, service plan. <laughs> Hi, every, hi everybody. Um, so thanks so much for having me here today. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, you know, as you know, I run two railroads, so I'm, I'm kind of running around like a lunatic a little bit today. <laughs> So I'm going to make the presentation and then I'm going to drop off and put Hector's on and he can, he can engage on the Q&A of anything that's in the presentation. Um, I was over at LIA this morning, um, sort of talking a little bit about some of the exciting stuff happening out on Long Island. And um, I had some remarks I prepared for LIA. So I'm going to kind of, you know, kind of wing it a little bit and sort of adapt the LIA remarks for my friends at PCAC. So uh, without further ado, there's certainly a lot to talk about with PCAC, uh, but you know today's remarks are about how history is being made all around us on Long Island. It is a fantastic, exciting time for the Long Island Railroad. Um, I, you know, as you all know, I worked out in the Long Island Railroad from 2008 till 2011, uh, so I'm back, you know, a little bit more than 10 years later, and oh my God, how much has changed in the 10 years that I've been gone. Uh, it is a time when massive transformation projects that we have been talking about and promising for years are about to come to reality. Constraints that have long put a ceiling on how much service we can operate are falling away as we bring online two long awaited mega projects that are designed to improve Long Islanders commutes and make Long Island a more competitive business destination. The first, of course, is mainline third track, which is going to be activated in pieces in, uh, over the course of the, the latter part of this year. And as Governor Hochul announced at an event on Tuesday, Eastside Access Service to Long Island Railroad's new terminal at Grand Central, which has now been christened, I look a little suspicious there, don't I? Um, which has now been christened Grand Central Madison, and that's scheduled to be done by the end of the year. Um, so the press event on Tuesday was really exciting for me because, you know, those of you who know the terminal know that we've had that enclosure around uh, the dining area over to the west in place, I don't know, three, four, five years now. And they temporarily removed that dining, con the, the, the enclosure around the dining concourse um, and, uh, you know, revealing the stairs between the dining concourse and the, the Long Island Railroad space at Grand Central. Um, so for me, you know, who wears the two hats these days, walking down from one railroad to the other railroad for this event for the very first time, um, it felt didn't feel like a construction site. It felt like a railroad. And it was just super exciting for me to be able to walk down from the dining concourse into the Long Island Railroad space. And, um, you know, during the governor's event, and I kind of called it out during my remarks, Lisa was there, you could actually hear the trains. Um, so there were trains running into and out of the new station. Um, as many of you know, we've been doing um, PC training, uh, physical characteristics training um, for, uh, for you know, Long Island Railroad employees so that we're ready to be able to start running the service uh, before the end of the year. There are multiple readiness activities underway now uh, with the project. We work very, very closely with the CND team and those efforts are underway and you know, being pursued in earnest so that we're ready to run the service by the end of the year. Um, as you all know, because this has been out there for a couple hours now, we are set to release draft timetables for all branches later today. Um, they're going to really flesh out the magnitude of the service increases that the projects are going to unlock. And our customers will be able to start thinking about what their travel could look like after they have the option to take the train to Grand Central Madison. It is no exaggeration to say that there is no railroad or public transportation system in America that's getting bigger service increases than the Long Island Railroad will be getting in a couple months. 
in one stroke, we will be increasing service by 40%, which is a staggering number for us. Typically, you know, you just sort of adjust things here and there by a percentage point or two when you're doing routine schedule updates. This is a crowd that I know is very interested in facts and figures. So here's a couple of facts and figures about the new service plan. The number of morning rush hour trains into Manhattan will increase by 58%. So from 76 trains to 120 trains. The number of afternoon rush hour trains from Manhattan to Long Island will increase from 98 trains to 158 trains. The number of reverse commute trains will increase by 65% from 81 to 134. And there'll be reductions in running time for trains throughout the system. The opening of Grand Central Madison will provide a permanent home for the Long Island Railroad in Manhattan that is not controlled by any other railroad or shared with any other operations. As you know, the Long Island Railroad and Metro North operations are distinct and separate in Grand Central, um, so that a delay or incident on one railroad really shouldn't spill into the other. And as an operations president, I can attest to how important having that second Manhattan terminal is. Having that robust service into the Grand Central Madison terminal will allow for operations to continue in the event of any sort of service disruption at Penn, like that ever happens, right? And minimizes the disruptions that will result from Amtrak's East River Tunnel Replacement Project in a few years. The proposed schedules that we're gonna be releasing accommodate that upcoming Amtrak work, so we're not gonna to need to further reduce service when the work begins in a few years. For Long Islanders who work on the east side, this is the benefit that we've been talking about for 15 years now, taking the train to Grand Central Madison will reduce commutes by up to 40 minutes a day. And taken together with the third track project, the opening of Grand Central Madison will enable robust reverse peak commute opportunities, opening up jobs on Long Island to New York City residents in a big new way for the first time. Um, as those of you who know the Metro North system can attest, you know, if you operate reverse peak service, New York City residents will use it to commute to jobs in the suburbs, um, you know, from uh, office workers, construction workers, domestic workers, all kinds of employees will now have the ability to commute from the city to job opportunities out on Long Island. The other thing that I've been talking about a lot since I've been wearing these two hats is the interconnectivity between the two railroads, which is not really something that had been historically talked about as one of the benefits of the project, but something that I'm really excited about, especially you know, as we sit in this kind of post-COVID place um, where uh, we're trying to attract different kinds of riders back to the system. The ability to use Grand Central as a transfer point between the two railroads literally overnight will make it possible for businesses in Queens and Long Island to attract employees from the Bronx and points north. Um, and you know, with the region still recovering from the impact of COVID upon work and travel patterns, the interconnectivity between the railroads will allow for greater discretionary and leisure travel between the new systems. Attracting Westchester residents like me to Long Island beaches and wineries in the summer uh, and Long Island residents up to the Hudson Valley de hiking destinations in the fall. Um, for those of you who are baseball fans, if you're Yankee fans who live on Long Island, it's going to be an awful lot easier to get to the stadium. And if you're a Met fan living up in the Bronx, it's going to be an awful lot easier to get out to City Field. And for those who will continue to use Penn Station after Eastside Access or Grand Central Madison goes live at the end of this year, it's going to be a more pleasant and easier experience because it's going to be less crowded. Um, you know, this is all kind of back of the envelope now because of post-COVID uh, ridership trends, but we estimate that roughly 50% of our current Long Island Railroad customers into Penn are going to shift their travel patterns over to east, uh, over to uh, east side access. So I'm just going to sort of pause for a second because that's a lot of exciting stuff, but we are not resting there. There's a lot of other exciting stuff underway. Um, the advent of service to Grand Central and the anticipated reduction in passenger volumes at Penn is going to give MTA a unique opportunity to pick up the pace of work as crews completely transform Penn Station. Uh, the plan is for it to become a single level concourse, high ceilings, natural light, greater connectivity to platforms, better and larger entrances, more intuitive travel paths. It will build on the work that's currently underway there now, which I know has been something of a hardship to our customers for the last couple of years and which is now drawing to a close. In fact, at the governor's press event uh, earlier this week, she hinted at a major announcement about Penn Station reconstruction that should be coming soon. So in short, with advanced technology and enhanced technology that makes customer information easier to access than ever before, our new M9 cars that continue to arrive on the property, a truly transformative new terminal all its own over at Grand Central, enhanced mainline capacity, 
all of these things will transform the experience of riding the Long Island Railroad and make it really exceptional. Um, I have to say, you know, as I said, it's, um, you know, I've been wearing this dual hat for, for oh my gosh, three months now. Um, but it is such a thrill having grown up as a Long Islander to be the one who gets to be the president when all this exciting stuff is coming online. Um, you know, my parents still live on Long Island. My family's still on Long Island. I go to Long Island all the time. And just, you know, how this is going to revolutionize regional travel throughout the entire area, um, that I'm the one who gets to sit in this chair having this conversation with you nice people. It's just like a real thrill for me. So um, thanks for inviting me here today. Um, I've got my good friend, Mr. Garcia, who's here, and he can answer any questions that you might have. Um, and we'll be dropping the schedules at some point later on this afternoon. And then I know you're going to have a lot of questions. So um, thank you all for inviting me here today. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, can you take a question or two? Hector's going to handle it for us. So, Andrew, you got the first Hector, do you have access to the slideshow that Kathy just presented? Yes. Can you go back to the more choices slide, please? <laughs> All right, let me. Uh, blah, 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 blah. There we go. So that slide, that map implies kind of a through service from Metro North Territory to Long Island Railroad Territory. You're not anticipating any through service. You're anticipating a change, of course, at Grand Central Madison, correct? Yeah, no, we're not implying any through service. This is just, you know, you know, once we're going to Grand Central, once uh, Metro North is going to Penn, you know, will be interconnected in a way, so you can connect from one to the other easy, easy, more easy, easily. Because okay, that map sort of implies a through service, but uh, <laughs> thank you. It was just an arrow. There was, there was, there was no words on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, should, it, it should have a just clarification. Hector, it, should, it should be a, a broken arrow. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I, something that just occurred to me looking at that slide. Uh, are you going to have through fares? people be able to buy through tickets to Long Island to Metro North Territory and vice versa? Uh, we haven't gotten that far yet. Right now it's, right now it is just different fares. It's something that you can get done. Thank you. With Omni maybe, All right? Yes. I got one. Hey, Hector, now when you're doing all this major uh, rescheduling, is there going to be any effect to Brooklyn? Because I know you have that brand new platform that was going to be exclusively for Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that being incorporated into the service changes as well, or is that going to be a separate issue? No, no, this is this is all it's all together. It's, it's a system. Okay. Everything is built to work together. Um, okay, is it still basically the same that we discussed previously, that you'd still be able to get some direct service to Brooklyn during rush hour, and then it would just be the up and over during off-peak off -peak there times? Will, there will be a few peak train uh, the, uh, the, through service. Not a lot, but there will be some trains. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to be up and over for Brooklyn service. Okay. First. Gentlemen in the back. I think you're. What kind of data do we have on um, expectations for transfers from Long Island passengers at Grand Central into the subway? Um, and what kind of estimates do we have on capacity to handle that? Right now, uh, the schedule that we're going to be putting out there is based on the data that we have. You know, once once it's out there, you know, things have been changing in the last few years with COVID. You know, once it's up, you know, once it's live by the end of the year and into next year, we'll we'll have the flexibility to make adjustments as needed. We're we'll, we're going to provide the service where people want to go and where they need it. So we, we're doing. We took the best shot we we you know we we could based on the information we had and based on the capacity, and then we'll you know we'll make changes as as. as if, if there's a need for change, we'll be able to change. Well, I guess the question is, all of the 40% discussed by, by President Rinaldi was all about Long Island Railroad service. Are there any changes happening to Lexington Avenue service in, in the subway? Um, I, th I think we need, we need to wait and see how, you know, how, how, um, we, we don't have, we don't, we don't know what's going on. You're expecting 50% of Long Island Railroad passengers to move to Grand Central. I don't think we have to wait and see. We have to know a large number of them are going to be on the subway. 
but a large number of those people are also on the subway now anyway. They're just going a long way by going through the, uh, the shuttle, the Grand Central Times Square shuttle or around, because I worked on the east side, so... But they're so not going I don't downtown. think it's going to be a big increase in Lexington Avenue. They will have a they're not going downtown from Grand Central. They could, especially if, especially if they're forced to go up and over to Platform F. They might decide, if I have a seat, I'm going to go to the New York Terminal and then take the subway. That's what I'm saying. Right. No, that's, that's my that's point. That's what he's saying. There's going to be a large number of people traveling downtown from Grand Central. There could well be. From, yeah. from, some, from some of the conversations that, I, that I've heard in the last, over the last few days also, um, from what Jano has been saying, the area around Grand Central is expected to increase its, um, the, the number of people who are going to return to office and new office space um, and, and, and the like in that area. area. So that there might be more walkers, more walking or, you know, people who are going there and not taking a transfer. I don't know what those numbers are, but actually that would, that would be good to know if there is any kind of... Um, planning study that was done with transit oil. Um, if right. I um, so I was curious, with the addition of the second terminal, is that going to result in increased service on the railroad during off-peak hours? Because right now, you wait services once every hour. So I would be that opportunity. So there's going, to be an increase, there's going to be an increase in service overall. And for example, if you look at the current schedule that, that was that was constrained by the infrastructure, you know, on certain branches, you would have a train and then like say 10, 15 minutes later, you would have another train. We're looking to also spread the trains out throughout the course of an hour. To, so in some instances, you have, you know, uh, less less longer waits and the, the, the schedules is more kind of a more regular basis in a sense. So we're trying to spread it out. It's two hours and they all peak on some branch. Like, wow. wow. Actually, what time do you think yeah. we can anticipate the schedule drop? Uh, this afternoon, between like by three o'clock. Okay. Oh. Right. Thank you. I'll look at them. Turn Thank you very yeah. much. Um, may I, Hector, can I suggest, if you haven't done this already, what, what Lisa just spoke about is the mayor's hope and prayer maybe also that there will be a lot of returning to uh, to Midtown and to for businesses and offices in Midtown. At the same time, there are other indications from especially other various uh, commerce and building groups that it's going to change and that there will be more people working in, Karen, forgive me, that's what they call it, the outer boroughs or the non-Manhattan. The boroughs. The boroughs, yeah. You go. yeah. I know, no, I, 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 that's why I said the boroughs, the other boroughs, how about that? The other boroughs. Um, and I would, I, I don't know, Hector, if you have been in touch directly with the mayor's office about your, your projected increase in service or, or whatever, or has, has the mayor's office been involved with all of your planning? I haven't, but you know, after we after we launch this between now and the end of the year, we're we're going to be aggressively engaging all types of stakeholders, including the mayor. So, before, um, no, I'm not saying after you launch it, before you launch it, so you know what's what is expected to happen. This there's six months between now and the end. I'm not saying you, uh, y'all, the <laughs> Howard Railroad planners and people. Has anyone? And if if not, I would strongly suggest that you do it now because this is one of Mayor Adams' main priorities right now, and if it, it should be worked, I would suggest anyway, that it be worked now, and, and also with the Manhattan Borough President's Office, who I've been speak, speaking oh, with ag about. Agree, agree. No, what, what I meant was we're launching the, the, the timetables now, the services later, but starting today, we are going to start engaging, you know, all stakeholders very aggressively, so. Okay. As, as, did you want to talk about the um, the, hear, the public meetings and hearings and people's opportunity to provide comments? Is there a good spot for that? Yeah, so, that, that, so that's going to be on the website also when it goes up today. We're going to be having a few virtual information sessions where we'll kind of give some an overview and explain the logic that went into this and help people 
figure, you know, learn people how to how to use the schedules and see what the options are. And then we're also going to be having a, a public, a virtual public meeting to, to get comments. So they can either give verbal comments, but also to the website, you will we'll be taking uh, written comments also. Chris, uh, Hector, good to see you again. Um, the one thing that I know Kathy brought up a lot about the infrastructure, but it would be nice to hear a little bit more about the accessibility that's going to be adding into Grand Central and the uh, Platform F, because I might know it, but not the rest of the uh, group here and the guests who are watching and listening. No, yeah, so we'll, we'll be working with you, Chris. We're going to be doing that. <clears throat> Again, right now we're just launching the timetables. There's still a lot of work to be done before the service starts. Uh, you know, and we anticipate, say, in the fall, We'll also be out at stations and engaging, you know, customers because as as it, as it becomes more real, you know, we're going to be increasing our outreach and engagement. So, all we're going to be covering all of that. Alrighty. Okay, Tom Stewart. Uh, Stewart, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm really at a disadvantage because I'm not there today physically. You asked the question that I was going to ask of Kathy and and uh, Mr. Garcia but I want to expand on it now that the discussion has evolved. So it may be out of sequence, but I'm at a disadvantage today. So with the uh, outliers like Brooklyn and Hunter's Point, I'm interested in a little more um, alliteration on the, re the, the number of trains. I'm excited to see that there are additional trains, but trains coming into these ports as opposed to leaving the destinations. Is service increasing uh, in both directions? Yes, the, 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 you know, again, all these projects in conjunction will allow us to start actually providing reverse peak service. So not only are trains going into Penn and Grand Central, we're gonna, trains are gonna be, people are gonna be able to get out to, to jobs and, and, and things on Long Island, whether for work or even for pleasure. So no, yes, that's, not, that's not the question. I'm talking about jobs <laughs> and activities in the borough of Brooklyn. The Long Island Railroad started in Brooklyn. We're talking about a change in a service pattern. The material so far in the media talks about an increase in service from Brooklyn. I'm asking you if the plan table to be released today talks about an increase in service to Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. So someone else asked about through trains because the material that's been put out on the web alludes to that, and you answer that in part about peak periods. So are we talking about um, only during weekdays so that on weekends there wouldn't be any through trains? Right now, the, the through trains, the, the logic is, is for during the peak periods, there'll be a few through trains. Okay, so then I think what Trudy was talking about is my last comment, that we need to make sure that we're consulting the city of New York and planners and others involved in the conversation because we have the Barclay Center right at the hub of the railroad. They have uh, events. And, um, you know, there was other discussion about then increased loads on the subway if people decided to go through Manhattan and then travel on the subway to Brooklyn. We really need to be conscious of not disenfranchising riders that start their trips in Brooklyn or Long Islanders or others that are heading to Brooklyn as a destination. Also Hunter's Point as well, because Long Island City is an area of development that the city is still focusing on. So we really have to be careful about that. Understood. Uh, Andrew, you had a yeah, I, Hector, I, this is not your fault, but um, I've seen it so many times in all of this publicity about how great um, the new connection is. I think it is gonna be wonderful, but I really wish you wouldn't say you're gonna save 40 minutes travel time. Unless you've missed both trains in the middle of the night from Penn Station on the one, two, or three to Times Square, and then you know the seven train because the shuttle doesn't run overnight, you, it takes 10 to 12 to 15 minutes max to go from Penn Station to Grand Central. So that's sort of an oversell, don't you think? Or you can't say, I'm sure, but. <laughs> oh, it's 40 minutes total. Oh, so 20 minutes in the morning. You walk is 20 minutes. That's not good. It's just not 40 minutes. Oh, when Kathy said it, she said 40 minutes in your day. So I, I could put it 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back. 
And I can uh, verify that's approximately right based on my past experience. Yeah, it could be 20 each way. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Could, be. Yeah. could be. Could be. All right, let's move on. Um, Oh, yes. I, I thought you might be saying my name. Can you summarize the extent of off-peak service increases? I'm sorry if that's that was asked while I was away for that one minute. Uh, I, I don't have the number at the top of my head, but you know it's, it's an overall increase. So you'll when it's later this afternoon, you'll be able to you know look it up specifically. So what we're going to do is we, to make it a little easier, even though we have typically 11 branches, we're going to have additional timetables. We broke some of the branches out so that it's easier for people to see their options based on the stations that they're using. So you're gonna you're gonna see that later. So it's gonna be and it's gonna look like a like a regular timetable. So you can actually you know see the train times okay. and then see what you know at what you know at which times which train goes to Grand Central and which ones go to Penn and vice versa in both directions or Atlantic Terminal or. Will those be paper timetables? <laughs> uh, you'll be, you'll be able to. Uh, it's going to be like a chart online, like a like it's going to look like a paper timetable. So we made it easier to print out, and, and and you know, like the typical timetables are unwieldy to print out. So we made it so on the eight and a half by eleven paper horizontal, you'll be able to you know look at it easily. Can they have paper ones at the station? Oh no, it's been a lot of going battle. Okay, um, we have a couple of people on line who had questions. Um, uh, Charlton, your hand is still up from earlier. Did you have a question for Hector? Or is that still related to your bike question? Yes, I had a question for Hector. What I want to know is, will there be overnight and weekend service to Grand Central? And, uh, you know, for people from Queens uh, 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 to come into Manhattan. And also what I want to know is, will city ticket be accepted at the new Grand Central station and the new, eventually, freedom ticket? Thank you. Uh, there will be service. Uh, I, I believe you know Grand Central currently closes at a certain time, so uh, our service may may mimic that. So the, the in terms of the current operations at Grand Central, they close for a certain amount of hours. So I believe our terminal is going to be closed also. Uh, and in terms of the the city ticket, I, I don't know the answer to that yet, but I'm, I'm I believe it it should be, uh, but I don't have the answer directly though. Um, oh, yeah. We have finished the dog. Who has a question? Hi, Hector. Um, just one question. Um, so if a person would uh, want uh, direct uh, station access between Grand Central and um, Penn Station, um, since it's within subway limit, uh, would the fare be 275 or would like a person have to show a metro card and like they would waive the fare? I don't know, what, what was the question? What the fare to Grand Central would be? Yes. Oh, so the Grand Central fare would most likely, I know that has to, it's probably going to be the same as Penn Station. It says Penn Station is city's own one, so Grand Central is, is in the city, so it'll probably be just the same fare as Penn Station or Grand Central. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Deborah, Deborah, Greg, um, I think Deborah, you're okay for uh, the response that you received. Um, not completely, because um, I'm going. The reason I put the questions in the chat, and I'm not going to go into all of them. People with disabilities and seniors, we need to know with the east side access. We need to know where are the elevators because it's very hard to find elevators in Grand Central. It's a lot easier in Penn, but you also have taken away a lot of elevators in Penn Station with all the repair work. So it would be nice if you also put it on the map saying, we're gonna have a bathroom here, we're gonna have the elevator here, we're gonna have things that people with disabilities need to know. And I need to also know, are you gonna have gigantic signs for people with visual issues, braille on the walls where it has to be? These are things that could have been easily addressed that we are also working with the, access, the community, the senior and disability community, and we are going to be doing this. Also, you not once did you say anything about Long Island Cares is going to be over at Grand Central. I need to know these things too. I represent a very large community of people with disabilities and have children with development disabilities. We need to know in advance of 
we can get ourselves ready and train them how to use this, those both terminals. That's all I have to say. And thank you, Lisa, for asking. That, that's what we intend to do during those uh, information sessions. So we're going to kind of explain some of the logic so you guys can, so the public can understand. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. One quick one, Jerry. All right, Andrew, one. Hector, on, on, when you develop these schedules, is every branch going to have an equal number of Penn Station and Grand Central uh, trains, or will some branches have more of one than the other? How about Atlanta, too? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's a, a formula like everyone is exactly the same, but you know, yeah, I don't know what the, I don't know exactly. It's uh, each branch will have service to both. I don't know how it's how it's split up by branch. That that's okay. there's other factors involved, you know, for those decisions. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Um, do you have another question, sir? Yeah, I do. So. It's clear that right now the plan is to give a few branches service to both terminals. But there's probably a way to minimize weaving or interlining by dedicating certain branches completely to a single terminal. And to that end, have you guys thought about building that long proposed sunny side station to enable transfers such that that's less of an issue? I mean that's that's not on that's not on the horizon right now. That, that station, there's, there's been talk about it, but this it's not is nowhere right now in terms of the service. Well, given the benefits of minimizing interlining in terms of running service, you know, I'd encourage you guys to look at that with a more critical eye. I mean, but I mean, each branch that the lot, you know, we're looking to have trains from each branch to go to both terminals as much as possible um, so that you know so then you have a choice you can either you know wait for the next train or you can take the train and get off at a different station to to to, to transfer to a, to a train that goes to the way you want to go in case you missed it or something sure but that comes at a cost of at an of an increased number of merges that tend to increase run times and and decrease reliability and i hope that ways to reduce reliance on interliner consideration going forward. All right, thank you. Um, I, I, just, I just wanted to say we've gotten, um, we've gotten on my own personal screen several um, reiterations about Atlantic uh, Terminal um, and the need to, to reiterate and the, and the request to reiterate that there be uh, sufficient service, particularly one seat ride, to Atlantic Terminal uh, and reduce wait times or, or not lengthy wait times in Jamaica. So I am reiterating that. Gentlemen in the back. Uh, Mr. Axon, and I think we're. Uh, Jerry, question. Where are we? Okay. Just 
Okay, two, two quick two quick questions for Hector. Uh, first, uh, will if if you get a blackout uh, down deep below in, in the new terminal, and nothing's working other than a couple of emergency lights, it's going to be quite a disaster. So, are they planning generators? That's question one. And question two, just it was more a comment that. You know, there was a brief discussion before about people who would go both Metro North and Long Island Railroad. Right now, if I wanted to commute from East Northport to White Plains, it would be about a six hour round trip from my house to an office that's five minutes away from the station in White Plains. This is gonna take it down to about five hours, still not feasible. And I'm just saying, please keep that in mind as during future planning, because. ESA still does not make that uh, viable. But on the first question, the generators. I mean, I'm sure we have backup systems in place, just like we have at Penn. I don't know specifically what we have at Grand Central, but I'm sure we do have some backup generators and things. Yeah, at Penn, it's a lot less critical. You just need lights. I know someone who is disabled can't get up steps and stuff, but there's a lot fewer steps. But it, with ESA, and I'm, I, I won't call it, you know what, it's yeah. going to be far deeper. And it's important that we actually know that uh, Long Island Railroad has something in place. So, you know, between now and the end of the year, there's a lot of work to finish, you know, get ready to open up. Part of it is training staff. And part of it is we started to do some tabletop exercises where we have scenarios like there's a loss of power, there's a, you know, different things happening and we're coordinating with other agencies and even internally to figure out how to coordinate. Yeah, even, even just coordinating with Metro North itself with, with the railroad now, since we're all in the same general vicinity. So we're, we're going through those scenarios now so that we're ready before we open up to the public. I, I, I offer a suggestion, transport for London and then starting to open Crossrail, they opened the first section, but before they did it, they have had, obviously you're doing train testing and other testing. They have done videos, including all sorts of public participation in DR tests and things like that. And I'm not saying this would make a lot of new things for the railroad to do, but I'd love to see you guys look into doing that. So people can see the answers to a lot of these questions. What happens if there's a power outage or an emergency, you know, down, you know, way down below Grand Central and other spots? All right. Gary, I have a point. Okay. Right, we'll I think there's other questions that can be there. There are four public meetings that are coming up, um, and there, there are other questions. Please, uh, if, anyone, if anyone has questions that are not answered, you can send them to. Um, Tisha has offered that we can send them to Hector, but we can be a clearinghouse for them too. We're going to take one last question from I'm just going to be Sorry, I'd like to. Uh, this is for Ron as well. And Hector, we discussed this at the ADA task force meeting. From LQ said that they have been working with the FDMY and they are continuing working on ADA training for emergency. So please be aware, Ron, that this is not the first time this was discussed. Uh, we did discuss it at the ADA task force meeting. Uh, Karen can vouch with me as well as, um, as, well as Deborah Bryce as well. We do, uh, Q has mentioned this very seriously taking this seriously for all railroads for a fire and safety emergency, including blackouts. There are certain things for a reason, that's why they're working on those, period. Thank you, Chris. Alrighty, so that will conclude the questions for Hector. Um, we're gonna go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I heard it from here. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Alrighty, so we're gonna circle back to Thank the you. Metro Metro Council's chair report. Up, Randy. Good afternoon. Uh, one comment about the police on the trains. I have ridden a number of Metro North trains lately and have seen them sit there standing in a doorway somewhere. And, and I just went over to them. I said, last week's committee meeting. Oh, 
talking about how much they enjoy seeing the police horses in the train. Okay, so. It's not here, it's on the chair. Alright, so. Uh, I think it's in my report. I mean, if the hour is late, I have other things to do. If there's anything anybody wants to question on, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, uh, Randy, Randy, a uh, question for you because I've seen that there's been a train test between New Haven and New London. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> do you have an update on that? I wrote it last week. I know. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Very well. It yes. Very well. Has, here's the. Uh, you think those trains are going to be running? Going to New London will be easier to run? They're running, they're using now MA cars between New Haven and New London. Yeah. So what easier about what? No, because I think it is a great idea to use those train cars because they move yes. very quickly. Yes, they have a higher acceleration rate. You're right. And, yes. and what I'm saying is this. The shoreline is, yes. Yeah, the shoreline. Thank you, Andrew. But I see a lot of people saying, can we have those trains, please? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, there were a few people. There weren't very many people riding the train. It was a late morning train, 25 out of um, New Haven. But um, people said they were happy to see those cars then, rather than these were all trains that have been operating there since 1990. Although newer versions they've replaced over the years. Well, just to bounce with yeah. Randy, a lot of them are using the Amtrak train from New London to New Haven because I was on it and it was full. Okay. So. Oh. All right, thank you. All right. Carlton, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, what I want to know is with the uh, combined ticket from Grand Central to New London, um, I always buy the two tickets separately, um, but what I wanted to know was in New London, they don't have ticket machines there. You have to buy the ticket from Amtrak, and a lot of times Amtrak told me that they don't even take cash. So that's a big issue. So they need to put a vending machine for Shoreline East there. And I've also noticed on the M8 cars that are running on Shoreline East, they still have the MTE logos on there. They don't have the Shoreline East logo on the trains. So when are they going to put all that in? And also it's the platform. It's the Connecticut DOT service and they, have, they buy 65% of the cars that were bought are Connecticut, and they can use them where they, they see fit. Um, and you can pay cash on the train. I don't right. know about but, I know that you can pay cash on the shoreline. Yes. Right, but a lot of the conductors were saying, you know, that they, they, they'd rather not have it. There's some confusion about that. That's what I was alluding to, and I think they need to make that pretty clear. But I also think that, you know, because of the casino service, you have, um, you know, Foxwoods and you also have Mohegan Sun in New London. So they should have like a Metro North package from Grand Central to those casinos to generate more revenue for like a day trip. That's something Metro North should try to do. I brought that up to Kathy Rinaldi and I don't know what happened, but maybe y'all could look into that. Thank you. All right, thank you. They couldn't keep a bus. All right, so is that... Yeah. All right, so that's it. No other questions? All righty. Um, old business to bring up. Actually, I got one for the old business. Uh, it circles back to the, the bike ped legislation. I know some people here are politically connected. Uh, legislation that they put out was faulted, uh, so we need to get an amendment to it. Uh, we're supposed to have three additional council members. Uh, the one for transit riders is not an issue because that's to be appointed by the mayor. The representative for Metro North, the representative for the Long Island Railroad, there's no mechanism to have that person appointed. Who, who, who makes the recommendation It's not there. So that has to be clarified in the legislation or we're never going to get a representative. As it is, we're going to lose a year anyway. Because Albany shuts down this afternoon, they're done. Yeah. So next legislative, whatever's going to happen, going to happen, happen. The next legislative session, what we would like to do is have somebody prepared to address this when the next legislation session opens, which might not be until January, right? Yeah. Unless they call the January, January, yeah. January yeah. 1st. So 
So we want to have something set up so that January 1st they can resolve it because you know how long it takes to get a representative. I'm sure we'll notice that in the legislation. We'll yeah. try and make that change in the elected officials that we spoke with said that the representatives of the elected officials that we spoke with said they didn't feel that there was any need to further change the legislation. So then well, we don't, we'll, then we we'll don't get the representatives. So right. Who is the, the representative from, uh, from Metro? Who are the two legislators? Senator Biagi and uh, Assemblywoman Jessica Gonzalez. Okay. So a then, former TRC member, you may recall. Yes, yes. Yes. No, so you may want to contact yeah, them. Yeah, oh, we the did. People who put in the list. Contact them directly. Yeah, we, we tried that. Suggestion yeah, we spoke because them. right now they are all focusing on the re redistricted districts. Yes. And the re redistricted districts. And so unless you contact, and staff is going to be changing. So I strongly suggest maybe you, as the head of the PCAC, send, send a letter to the two legislators who put in the legislation initially, pointing out what you just pointed out now. That's the only way. And we did that back in December. No, do it again, because things have changed since December. They're, they're representing different districts, different areas. I'm just... It's a suggestion, knowing how the legislation works quite well, that you write to the two people, two legislators. All right, we'll send a follow-up letter to those exactly. two people. Yeah, we'll yeah, send exactly. a follow-up saying, that, send me contact I, I am just December, trying to you know, make, make your life simpler, do it that way, rather than going to the staff or anybody else. Well, Sorry? Yeah, no, if you address it to them, though, they will see it. Trust me. All right. Hey, Jerry, Larry, Jerry. Here. Yeah, Larry, what's up? Uh, I had a question for Hector, but I couldn't get in because I'm, unfortunately I'm driving. But I, I guess Hector's not on anymore. Is that correct? I'm still, I'm yeah. still here. Oh, can, can oh, I yeah, ask Hector a question? But, but, I'm, but I'm not taking any questions. My time is up. Oh, my time is up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a lot of Just kidding. When you can't see your face, my God. I, my, my quick question for Hector is at the Belmore train station, so one of the front lots, two thirds of it is being taken by construction. Is that LIRR construction or is that just somebody else that's storing their pipes and trucks there? Because the other day I went to park in the lot and I had to go all the way to a back lot because that two thirds of that front lot is taken by piping and construction trucks that are not MTA. So I was wondering if you knew anything about that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any railroad projects there. I know there's a project, a county project that they're putting this new, uh, this, this new uh, sewer pipe to bring uh, the stuff from Cedar Creek all the way to, uh, it's like a sewer project that's going along Sunrise Highway, so it may be that project, but it's not us. Do you know, do you know that they're taking two thirds of a front lot, a parking lot for their pipe storage? I wasn't aware of that, but I'll look into it. Well, there you go. And all right, and then I got another thing for Jerry for everybody to start considering. Uh, I was with the governor yesterday at LaGuardia Airport on the new opening of Terminal D, which is the new terminal for LaGuardia to bring it into the 19th terminal century. C. The 20th. C, C, C as my name, Christopher. Terminal C is combined. No, 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 no. D as in da da. Oh, it is D. No, it's called Terminal C. Hey, whatever, the ter LaGuardia region. The new, LaGuardia. the new terminal of LaGuardia. It's Terminal D, the new terminal of LaGuardia. The question is, I think we should start oh, okay. thinking about making recommendations about how we can service and get people to LaGuardia Airport. Because as we know, the Governor Cuomo uh, air train has been squashed down. So, but I think we gotta start thinking about it because the Terminal D, as in David, is opening up Monday um, or maybe the Sunday. But you know, it's, I think we have to start thinking about how people can use MTA services other than a bus to get to the terminal at all hours of the day and night. And Jerry, uh, Larry, that's something we have been thinking about and talking about and um, discussing at Transit Riders Council and at um, LARCC. And I have expressed to many people, including people at the MTA, how an air train from Woodside Long Island Railroad Station, which serves virtually every branch, over the BQE and into the airport would serve loads of people. And as Judy pointed out at our last TRC meeting, um, the governor has um, appointed a task force that's looking uh, into the different options. There are 14 or 14 and a half. There's a lot. There's a lot. A lot of um, options. And they're going to come um, back with their recommendations so. soon. But we've, we've testified at 
different public hearings um, recently, in fact, um, that talk about the need for service that's MTA service. Yeah, okay. And I'll just say the, the new terminal, which is being basically sponsored by Delta, uh, it's gorgeous. I mean, it really is nice, and it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to impact by getting 30 additional gates uh, to Delta for available, freeing up gates for other services to come in on the other terminals. But let me assure you that that is being taken under consideration on the highest level right, right now uh, about about getting to LaGuardia now that the terminal has doubled in size, the terminal, former terminals D and C, and it is now known just as Terminal C. Trust me on this. All right. Judy, Judy, trust me, you're not, you're incorrect. It is Terminal C right, and Terminal D. Okay. All right, whatever. Let's move on. We, uh, we have a couple more questions, and then we're going to... George, you had a question, sir? You had said old business. So again, um, at the last meeting, I'm the one that asked for the briefing on the new service pattern. I think as a body, we also need to see what the new schedules actually are, be mindful of the Brooklyn inbound and outbound service patterns. I think your question and the follow-up questions about transfers are important because in the literature right now, they talk about no guarantee that there would be trains meeting other trains, that'll change. So we have to see how the wait times increase at Jamaica for people traveling from Brooklyn and to Brooklyn. And you know we've discussed this ad nauseum about Brooklyn service, the scoop, the whole concept from beginning to end. But the last thing is we sponsored the freedom ticket or, uh, and we really need to look at the data, which has still not been provided on, to me anyway, on how it's being utilized and how that might change with the new service pattern. The concept of available slots and lack of ridership, maybe it'll change in a positive direction, maybe not, but we really need to take a look at that. And I just want that on the record. We worked very hard on this. Well, you'll see the you'll see the new you'll see the new schedules within the next couple of hours. So. George, I, I've watched so many press conferences and, and meetings with where Metro North and and uh, MTA staff they tout how well the, the city ticket is being received and the ridership numbers are up. So oh, yeah. they are very they're very happy. With, hmm? Yeah, so we can get that. There was um, actually AM New York did a story two weeks ago that looked at mm -hmm. both Atlantic ticket and city ticket. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we'll mm -hmm. make sure that that's. Yeah. And we have to monitor that, I think, in, in light of the new service pattern, because if, you know, if, if ridership is up, that's a great thing. If, uh, you know, if it dries up, that's another thing. And, and it would be a different type of messaging or branding that we would want to have with what we advocated before. And we have to monitor once, once the service and platform app begins, if ridership diminishes to Brooklyn, Stays the same or increases. They're advertising more frequent service with this separate platform, but it's going to be less convenient because if you arrive on tracks two or three in Jamaica, which most trains do, you'll have to go up and over to platform F, and they have to allow that time. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and that's my question, Andrew, about how much extra time do you have with there's no guarantee anymore that trains will be waiting to do a cross platform. Well, we got to look at the schedules when they come out. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Th yeah. Thank you. That's a Thank, Thank you, Stuart. We have about three minutes left. That's right. I just wanted to ask um, about the, just wanted to go back to the bike pen access for a moment. Um, if members, if you can please send us your comments. We've got several comments in the chat as well, um, in addition to the ones in the room that, and, and the ones that we've had in conversation that we've written down. But please send us your input and comments by noon tomorrow so that we can get them to the MTA. How many pages, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> this is, this, okay, remember, we want your comments on our suggestions, not on their plan. That you go to their website tomorrow. All right, thank you. All right, we're going to just take two more questions, and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, Karen? Uh, thank you. So uh, this is a reference to the Long Island Railroad. Um, at Rosedale, I know they're doing this major construction project and the new police station and so forth. The only ADA-accessible portion of the train is where the elevator is. Now it's like um, scaffold and it's, and you have a long walk so you can't drop someone off who needs 
to get onto the elevator. So I don't know what can be done, but that's bad. And a lot of times it's blocked off. You can't even park is, along. Is there any either. signage saying how long the construction is for? Not really. And like the other day I went to drop my mother off. I got stuck and I had to come out and go back another block to drop her off. So I had to take her somewhere else and luckily someone helped her up the steps. Um, and the other thing is then the parking spaces now have been taken over by the police department. So where there were two, and they park wherever, and so that's just something. Um, then also at Lawson, um, there's a farmer's market on the weekend, and they keep taking over the entire parking lot, and they try to tell people that they can't park there. And I say you don't know what time people are coming home. Also, you don't know if people uh, have accessibility issues, and they can't park on the street. They need to be as close. And that if you park on the street, then you need to allow for the time for them to walk and to go up the stairs, and they could miss the train. Trains only run every hour uh, on the weekends. Um, Karen, can I make a suggestion? That was likely authorized by the local community board. You may want to contact them and tell them about this problem. About the farmer's market? Yes, because our community board approves farmer's market requests for various places, so I'm sure theirs did too. But did they tell them that they can use the entire... I'm sure they did. It's not their lot to... I just wanted to say that the meeting on Tuesday uh, for the um, Queen's bus redesign, um, I, I just want to say that the FCA staff did, I think, a good job uh, mm -hmm. moderating the meeting. It, it, it's a far cry from what we saw two years ago. They were thoughtful, uh, very well informed, mm -hmm. and I, I just feel like, you know, people always complain, but I just think that, you know, we should acknowledge, you know, they, they've done a good job with these sessions. So I have to go. Mr. Rex, you Yeah, what's, what's your question? I just have a comment. I've mentioned before regarding the bicycle. The owners, the owners can buy the legal phones and so forth. They split them because they could escalate and put it that way. Oh, I hate that thing! Yeah, go ahead, keep going. That's, that's, that's it. That's it. Okay. Let me know when you get to your business. We're out of time. We're out of time. Move to adjourn. Second. Sorry, we have two more minutes. We'll get over at 2 p.m. That was an iPhone. All right, well, we have a motion to adjourn. Yeah, motion to adjourn. All right, separate right. next meeting. All right. Yep. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Apologies, please, if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat. Yep, write them in the chat.